At the time that we started this recording, live video feeds coming in from Gaza and the surrounding areas uh, showed that the Israeli uh, bombardment shelling uh, continued through the night. The skyline was lit up uh, by the fires ensuing from this bombardment. Uh, Israel's defense ministry has called for a total blockade on the Gaza Strip. Uh, we will try to understand what this means for the over 2 million Palestinians who live uh, in Gaza. And in the United Kingdom, a public inquiry has begun uh, to hear allegations uh, against the British military about alleged war crimes, including the killings of several civilians and unarmed people in Afghanistan uh, during uh, the country's 20-year occupation as part of uh, or 20-year participation uh, in the occupying force in that country. We try to understand what are the expectations that the public can have from this inquiry. Salam, you are watching Daily Debrief. Uh, take this chance to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Right, reports coming in from Gaza and from Israel indicate that over 1,300 people have already been killed since Hamas uh, launched a surprise military operation against Israel. Israel, in retaliation or as a response, uh, has launched the biggest ever airstrikes on the Gaza Strip in history, um, causing massive damage to homes, to civilian infrastructure, um, and of course, uh, life in the Gaza Strip to whatever extent it was allowed. Um, the blockade that is already in force uh, will be doubly reinforced. It's now going to be a complete blockade, including no entry of electricity, uh, fuel or food into uh, the Gaza Strip. Anish is with us uh, uh, and will be with us uh, for our continued coverage of what is happening uh, between Hamas and Israel and also, uh, well, uh, yeah, all of the other uh, aspects of this conflict and how uh, many players in the region are involved. Anish, uh, first up, the UN uh, chief is said that he is deeply distressed, particularly by the attacks on uh, civilian in infrastructure like uh, university, hospitals, uh, homes, of course. Uh, what has been the response, though, from uh, Israel's Western friends and allies uh, to the scale of the airstrikes against Gaza? Well, uh, it's a very typical response at this point in time. What we've seen from uh, the West, and by and large, and leaders of the West, politicians, is how they have uh, consistently uh, insisted on this line that the attack by Hamas was uh, unprovoked. And this is something that has been repeated ad nauseum across the board, across political parties. And it's, it clearly shows the inclination that the ruling elite in the West is pretty much, uh, uh, has pretty much when it comes to matters that concerns Israel and Palestine. And despite whatever uh, they might talk, talk about human rights or, you know, talk about uh, self-determination in other countries when it comes to Palestine, it's pretty much uh, the same kind of very occupier-friendly uh, narrative that we see. And uh, in some cases, there are al already uh, talks of, uh, you know, military aid, like Biden has already announced a military aid uh, and weapons uh, to Israel in its uh, supposed bid to defend itself. Uh, there's also this whole line of uh, them insisting that Israel has the right to defend itself when uh, United Nations have repeatedly, uh, and you know, various bodies within the United Nations have repeatedly pointed out that you, Israel is an occupying force and occupiers do not necessarily have the same kind of right of self-defense as, uh, you know, say a sovereign nation vis-a-vis uh, -vis another sovereign nation. Uh, mm -hmm. Occupying force does not have that kind of uh, pr uh, right against its uh, the occupied population, and in this case, we also need to look at 
how a lot of them are completely uh, you know obfuscating the uh, the history uh, not just uh, what we're looking at since 1948 or whatever but uh, it's also very recent history the fact that over the past two years uh, israel has actually uh, amped up its violence on palestinians it has mm. like last year itself there were uh, you know what was reported to be a record number of uh, killings in the west bank uh the same level of uh, and record number of arrests uh, uh under what they call as uh, administrative detentions all of that is ignored uh the number of uh, homes that were destroyed the number of villages uh that were uh, raised uh to make way for illegal settlements uh, that is also missing from this narrative and so is the fact that uh, gaza has been bombarded continuously for more than two decades now uh by israel with no concern for human rights no concern for uh, civilian life or unarmed citizens uh, it has attacked schools it has attacked hospitals it has uh, pretty much scrapped uh, the entire uh, you know gaza airport at one point in 2001 and all of that is completely missed out and this entire factor that israel has been provoking the population uh with no limit uh, with uh, with an intent to completely eliminate them is completely absent at this uh, at this uh, you know sort of uh, current set of reactions that we see mm. uh, and of course the un uh, chief uh, like we were mentioning earlier anish has focused uh, his comments particularly on the humanitarian condition uh, close to 45% unemployment already uh before these uh, this, this particular uh, conflict began or chapter in the conflict began uh 65 also percent of uh people are facing you know uh, hunger issues uh, food and insecurity yeah yeah exactly yeah. Uh, food insecurity and then uh, when refugee camps and, and and such places also come under attack it uh, further complicates the situation possibilities of outbreak of disease and all of those things uh so an already challenging humanitarian situation made much worse and definitely uh the the characterization of this as a siege is not uh you know without its reasons the fact that uh, this was already a blockaded uh, piece of land uh in fact the most blockaded piece of land that we have ever seen in given history in fact uh there has not been as uh, you know the kind of extensive blockade that actually even prevents it from accessing the seas which it is which borders it or for that matter uh you know any kind of aid that it uh, wherever israel starts attacking it uh and right now we have already seen the air strikes uh, targeting the tunnels the underground tunnels that actually was pretty much the lifeline uh for in many ways apart from you know being uh uh a source for hamas to uh, you know acquire its resources it was also a major lifeline for uh, the palestinians living there for aid for food for water even and this all of this is uh, a fact that they pretty much want to uh, you know conduct a, a cleansing of sort uh, and the fact that you know netanyahu made the statement that he wants to turn uh, gaza into a deserted island uh, it clearly shows the intent with which uh, israel is acting that it has shown no concern for international laws and it definitely does not intend to make uh, you know to, to be concerned about whatever international sanctions it might attract because of its actions what it cares about is just retaliating uh, to a point where it might even conduct a genocide of its own mm. uh and uh, so just uh, finally anish quickly uh, we can uh, anything from from uh, the israeli military uh, military's plans it, uh, is there sort of uh, indicators that possible uh, ground action will also be initiated um, to sort of complete what's going on yes definitely what we have uh, already see, we are seeing reports right now about how how israel uh, has declared that it, it is mobilizing about 300000 reserve uh, forces uh, in uh, you know in its bid to conduct its war on gaza 
uh, 300,000 for to deal with our 2 million population like uh, the excessiveness is obviously quite evident but it intends to invade uh, gaza at this point that's pretty much clear uh, how and when is the question and that is something that uh, we can be entirely clear on and something that we can't really get into right now as well uh, but definitely what we are looking at is that it is currently dealing with uh, the fact that the resistance is still there in Israel. It's still active and fighting in southern Israel. And the fact that this is happening despite all the airstrikes, despite the blockade, despite the kind of uh, you know siege that Israel is trying to lay on Gaza, that uh, the resistance fighters are there. And we have to remember they are fighting an occupation force. And even uh, this is something that is recognized by international law that they're fighting within territories that were actually uh, uh, you know, considered to be part of Palestine under the 1948 partition plan, which is something that most of the world, except for a handful of nations in the West, most of the world considers to be the uh, definite plan for any kind of two-state solution and considers uh, these territories to be part of Palestine and by extension Gaza. Uh, is the fact that these fighters are uh, trying to shine light on the fact that all the promises that Israel has been uh, has offered over the years about you know whatever uh, to Palestinians especially has been uh, refused and has been uh, withdrawn upon and that Israel is a proper occupying force in the territories that it is fighting right now. All right, Anish. Uh We'll, uh, we'll leave this part uh, here uh, for, for this episode of Daily TV Finish. Uh, but, but we will talk to you about a second story uh, as well and ask you, of course, to join us again, I'm sure, very soon uh, to continue uh, coverage of uh, the Israel-Hamas conflict that's going on and, and uh, how the resistance uh, will continue, given what's likely to be a full-on uh, military onslaught, uh, even more than it already is. Uh, our second story and our final bit for the day is, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, a public inquiry that's begun in the United Kingdom uh, on allegations of war crimes against the British military or members of the British military that were operating uh, while they were posted in Afghanistan during that country's uh, participation in the coalition occupation that lasted as long as almost uh, two decades. We have, of course, there are about uh, the allegation, these particular allegations pertain to as many as 80 uh, civilian deaths and also point to the involvement of an elite regiment, the SAS, the Special Air Service of the British military. Uh, Anish, you've been uh, also tracking developments on, on this and, and we have talked about uh, sort of uh, war crimes and atrocities committed by occupying forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan quite frequently. Uh, what 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 is happening here, and uh, how is it going to take the conversation on some of these issues forward? Well, it is quite an interesting uh, inquiry because this, uh, like the figures that we are looking at right now, eighty civilian deaths is not an exhaustive list. It is not, it probably is just the tip of the iceberg because uh, it is based on uh, the BBC uh, investigation uh, report last year, which found that about at least 56 civilian deaths, uh, uh, you know, were completely uncalled for and, uh, you know, and the SAS were responsible for it. And all of that happened under very questionable circumstances. And it took about more than a year for, uh, right now to actually for the government to hold an inquiry, uh, to hold a trial even, to actually get the testimonies in. Uh, and now we, we are seeing these 80 deaths. Now, we must remember that the BBC report itself was uh, talking about a six-month tour of a single battalion or of a single detachment of the SAS. And uh, it clearly shows that, uh, that this, the crimes probably are much, much bigger and much more prevalent and that something of this sort couldn't have just happened in a single detachment's uh, tour, and that it probably was the norm rather than, uh, you know, the aberration as some of them want to uh, talk about, or you know, like uh, uh, some kind of uh, collateral damage that the uh, that a war, a justified war, might have. 
but uh, so the fact that uh, this uh, inquiry is happening is good in that it is happening but the fact that uh, there is still uncertainty of how far it will go uh, because a the ministry of defense is not going to tour or visit the victims in afghanistan they're not going to investigate in afghanistan because obviously uh, there is no longer any you know proper diplomatic or you know uh, bilateral relations between uk and afghanistan because of taliban's takeover but on the other hand uh, we are uh, so what we have is pretty much uh, you know these testimonies of people afghans who are uh, you know who have access to the british judicial system uh, who are at least at the very least represented by uh, lawyers there but there are plenty of more that uh, need to be uncovered and it clearly shows that there needs to be some level of uh, you know soul searching by the british administration of its conduct in afghanistan and pretty much similar wars around the world because this is not the first time that we are looking at uh, you know a participant nation in the allied forces in afghanistan to be conduct, uh, to be found guilty of uh, you know war crimes we have similarly reported about australia uh, mm-hmm. about uh, about how a whistleblower who was just legal consultant to the military brought out uh, you know similar crimes uh, where you know these were not even raids or uh, you know uh, de- uh, killings that were committed in any kind of attacks these were you know many of them were uh, you know kind of rights of initiation for some cases uh, that sort of uh, it clearly shows a sort of a culture of uh, you know violence that was that of the occupying forces that really needs digging much deeper in but something that most states do not do australia in fact has responded by jailing or you know uh, prosecuting the whistle blower uh, in this case uk is slightly better but uh, we we have to see, uh, wait and see if they want if they are ready to take this forward and to actually dig deeper Uh, anish you know if, even in the context of the response to the air strikes uh, on gaza uh, western nations have been called out for their hypocrisy as you were pointing out also the comparative uh, when it comes to uh, ukraine uh, is there in your coverage of uh, various such inquiries uh, stories that come out whistleblowers who share information Uh, a sense within the establishment in these countries that actually coming clean uh, might sort of go some way towards uh, repairing that reputation of being perpetual hypocrites <laughs> i think uh, that's that's a very interesting question but i don't think that's uh, you know anywhere near the horizon here uh, it's uh, it's it's a very tricky thing because a lot of them do talk about international laws and or you know uh, maintaining uh, international law but many of them are biggest some of the biggest violators of uh, the said international laws and very often they do overlook uh, all of that uh, for their convenience um pro- primarily because they were pro- uh, you know former colonizers as well uh, so that uh, uh, you know that legacy definitely carries on but uh, there is also this fact that uh, many of them have never touched the fact that the international community rarely ever you know sanctions them with the same kind of uh, you know vigor and enthusiasm that they do to some other nations for far lesser violations uh, clearly shows is the reason why such impunity continues and the fact that we will continue to see some of the same kind of it's quite likely that we will continue to see similar atrocities in the near future unless something about it is done uh, we are looking at you know we are already talk, uh, talked about you know an oncoming invasion in another uh, part of the world we are looking at a current war in one part of the world and then there are other places that are you know reeling in different kinds of crises and in all of that uh, the warmongers are pretty much the same so right now uh, in this particular case it kind of pretty much opens up to the uh, to what they want to do they definitely want to save face because they were exposed so they are trying to put up an inquiry but you know some of the the fact that even the government is trying to not name sas 
itself. They're just trying to mention them as special forces because they want to, quote unquote, uh, you know, maintain uh, official secrecy uh, of their forces or their operations there. Is uh, clearly shows that they're trying to use various ways to protect themselves uh, from uh, any kind of uh, actual justice being meted out is uh, you know quite indicative of how things are going to move forward. But like I'm saying, like let's keep our hopes to the minimum. It's, if something good happens, obviously that's a different thing. Uh, we can you know celebrate, but it's quite rare for that those uh, to actually uh, you know those responsible to be actually taken to uh justice and that is something that you know it's it's not impossible but it's going to be far more difficult and it's definitely going to be a far longer process we're looking at it already something that is that has happened 13 years ago and we're hearing an inquiry right now so it clearly shows that the delay is going to be much much longer than uh what we would have normally expected in other cases all right. Thanks, Anish, uh, for giving us updates on both those uh, important uh, stories. And of course, we'll see you uh, very, very soon. Uh, for those of you who are watching, here's another chance to, of course, subscribe, but also head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, uh, for details on all of the work that we do. Um, also, you can get updates on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, if you like. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, thanks again for watching. Goodbye.